Hello. I'm Maria Bello, and I'm here with you today to share my vision of a new global women's movement. Now, traveling all over the world for the last 27 years, I have met so many women from so many different cultures, and I found three common threads that seem to connect us all, among others, that are usually the main themes of the conversation. They are our children, our love lives, and fashion. I'm going to give you an example. Here I am today. I come in for a conference, Women uh, in Darfur Against Genocide. I've worked with these women for many years. I haven't seen my friend Nima Adamati for about a year. Here's how the conversation went as soon as we saw each other. Oh my God, you look so great. I love your hair that way. Uh, how's Jackson? Is he good? Oh my gosh, you got so big. Is your husband still in Darfur? I'm so sorry he's stuck there. How's your life, Maria? How's your love life? Horrible. That was, our <laughs> that was our first five minutes. So imagine this. I was traveling in, in Kenya last June with five women friends that ranged in age from 22 to 62. We sat down with seven Maasai women, Maasai women who dressed in traditional garb and lived in mud huts, had earlobes down to here, and shaved heads. The conversation at first was a bit timid and wary as we felt each other out. It was about, so where do you live? How long does it take you to get to work? How do you get here? But this is honest to God truth. Within a half hour, we were a giggling coven of 13 women talking about how big we liked a man's organ in our cultures. This is no joke. And we wrapped a napkin and passed it around to each show each other how big exactly <laughs> the organ should be. <laughs> we, we traded secrets about our love lives. They said that in their culture, they have a husband and a lover. They were shocked and saddened to hear that I wasn't married or never have been. But I said, well, in our culture, we have many lovers. It's called dating. And then I realized I wasn't very good at that either. Um, we went on to children and how our teenagers were, if you have teenagers, just brats. How good breastfeeding is for our babies and how much it hurts to give birth. We also talked about sexual pleasure. Now, this is a very tricky subject because us Western women were thinking because most of the Maasai women uh, have genital mutilation, they could have no pleasure. One of the women translated this, and there was roaring laughter. And one of them made a sign like this, and said, what about the inside one? So the Maasai women didn't need a video or a crystal wand to figure out where the G-spot was. And that was something we were jealous of. I have had these types of experience with so many women all over the world. Over and over again, I was in a, a women's camp in Bosnia during the war, and these women had experienced horrific things. In a moment, they were mourning the loss of their husbands and loved ones, and in the next moment, we were painting each other's nails in their barracks. In Haiti, which I call my second home, and have just been named the ambassador for women, I have an entire family of women friends rich and poor and young and old and light-skinned and dark-skinned, women who live in tents and women who live in mansions. Of course, the main gist of our conversation on the first moment we see each other is exactly what I explained. But that's not the only ways that connect us, and we all know that. Let's face it, women are naturally more compassionate. We naturally work together as opposed to working against each other. We're more interested in our children's health and well-being in our communities than war for territories. And I can't think of any woman that would start a genocide. I can't think of any woman that would force a man to have sex with her in order to gain power. As Desmond Tutu said, when asked if, uh, how war could be stopped, he said, actually, it's very straightforward. Let women take over. <laughs> women are, by nature, more inclined towards compassion 
They're life-giving and life-affirming. Men have made a mess in this planet, and it's for women to fix it. <laughs> There is today, in my opinion, a new movement rising. It's a global women's movement that is, in its essence, defined and categorized by our common connections. Our children, our deep faith and compassion in collective decision-making and equal opportunity economically, socially, and politically. We are immersed within this ever-evolving growth rate of technology, and it has enabled us to connect with the other 52% of this world and figure out what we have in common. I call this new movement the Revelation Revolution. And I've had so many revelations working with the extraordinary women that I work with all over the world. The feminism behind the red stocking movement in the 1960s represented fighting for equal rights and opportunities or fighting against the patriarchal system that excluded women from the conversation that defines how we view world power. But today, I would like to pose to you this new layer that technology has equipped us with in order to build upon and expand this idea into a global movement. We may still be fighting for and against, but women all over the world are finding a new power and a new sense of themselves. We are advancing. What a revelation. There are new possibilities born of our common connections. The idea is that we're no longer victims, that the patri uh, patriarchal culture would be lucky to have us in their discussions, to be full participants in global policy. This revelation will define the transformation of the world, and it is happening quickly. 27 years ago, I was at Villanova University, where I was studying peace and justice, education, women's rights, and working at the Women's Law Project in Philadelphia. I read a quote from my favorite book, Out of Africa, that would define the rest of my life. You see, Karen Blixen had this baby bush buck, If you're not from Africa, you might not know. It's like a baby deer. It was orphaned by its mother, so she raised it, bottle-fed it. Um, it was like her child, until Lulu became a teenager, and then she was a nightmare. She tore apart the house, and she was doing everything she could to leave this secure place that she'd lived in for so long. One day, she disappeared. Karen was heartbroken. And many years later, she stood at her kitchen window, and she looked and saw the most magnificent creature standing at the edge of the woods. And she wrote, Lulu of the woods was a superior, independent being. A change of heart had come upon her. She was in possession. She was now the complete Lulu, The spirit of offensive had gone from her. For whom and why should she attack? She was standing quietly in her own divine rights. Ladies and gentlemen, the 52% of us right now are on the precipice of standing in our own divine rights and saying to the world, you do not have to include us. We're including ourselves. Thank you very much. We are empowering ourselves. And whether you like it or not, because of our common connections, we are advancing. And we will succeed in joining you to make our world a better place for our children. Here's another revelation. Many of you might know this. Statistics prove that when women are empowered economically, more money goes to their children's health and well-being, and more money goes back to their communities. We also know that hiring women is not only nice, it's good business. You look at a, a, emerging, a, a market like China, where women are almost equal participants in the workforce, and they're becoming an economic powerhouse. We've also seen that the more women who are elected or appointed in government, the more democratic the country is. We see Rwanda after the genocide. They have the highest percent of women in politics and are one of the fastest growing economies in Africa. Here's a few other revelations um, that have grown out of my time working 
with women's groups in Haiti over the last five years. Six days after the devastating earthquake in 2010, a couple of weeks into it, I was there six days later, working in an IDP camp of 50,000 people. Three weeks later, a woman came up in the camp and said, can you please help us? They'd organized a women's group. They said, we need a clinic. I was in awe to see how organized they were after all of this destruction. So with $5,000, we opened this clinic with the grateful support of my friend Sean Penn, because we followed the mandate that Haitian people know what Haitian people need. Now, this should not be a revelation. NGOs have been working in Haiti for more than 60 years. Just last week, I, I heard someone who I really respect from a U.S. government agency discussing the lesson, lessons they had learned after the Haitian earthquake, stating that it's not up to us to go in and tell people what they need based on our ideas, political agendas, or donor concerns. We have to let the people lead us and support them in their priorities. Well, no shit. <laughs> really? Let's face it, the old idea of aid is dead. We can no longer go to a country and define people's priorities and implement our own ideas. Haitian people know what Haitians need, Darfuri people know what Darfur people need, and, and most local communities know what they need. It's our job to listen, support, and help implement. When I went to Haitian with my Haitian colleagues to other larger NGOs that were getting tons of cash after the earthquake and said, hey, we only need $5,000 to start a, uh, a, camp, uh, a clinic in every camp. They said the same thing. Well, we need proposals. It would take months to get through. You have to work through the bureaucracy. So my Haitian friends and I organized and created an organization called We Advance with the intention of empowering women throughout Haiti to stand in their own divine rights. We called our organization We Advance, and we say we started it because basically we were pissed off. <laughs> we Advance understands the power of technology to connect women throughout the world. That's why we started just recently We Advance University. It's an online educational digital site that gives women access to services throughout Haiti that they wouldn't necessarily have had, that connects the networks of these incredible women's groups throughout Haiti and gives them educational videos and training tools to promote social justice and health. Uh, we also have a women's radio station where through mobile, uh, they can access the radio station and get training sessions through their mobile phones. This technology is quickly gaining momentum and helping the new global women's movement. And lastly, I would pose this question to you. How do you measure a movement, right? This is a global women's movement. There is such a small percentage of funding that is allocated by governments or NGOs to women's health, education, and well-being. Many women are not publicly counted in the workforce. They bring services to their communities, but get no recognition for it. In developing countries particularly, they have no idea what a proposal is or how to write one. I don't even know how to write one. The term that NGOs and foundations like to use is deliverables. I've come to detest that word. They run on a bunch of numbers and statistics on how many people have been fed or how many buildings have been built. Things you can see with your eyes and touch with your hands. But let me ask you this question. Would you, any of these organizations, have given a grant to Gandhi or Martin Luther King, the regular citizen who has started movements which have changed the world? Probably not without a good proposal. Now, I understand accountability as I run my own NGO, but we need to find a new deliverable. And I believe that deliverable is storytelling not only deliverables based on Western thinking. Right now, over half the world can tell their stories through a videotape or a blog or express it in any way, like Malala from Pakistan, for instance. Here she is, this young, ambitious girl, 14 years old. She started a movement of her own and was punished for it. And yet, through the media, her cause is gaining more recognition and attention than ever. Would you have funded her without a proposal? Don't you wish you had? 
to all you good-hearted NGOs and investors out there, I ask you to consider the idea of collecting real stories of what's happening with women's groups on the ground, to support those projects, like my friend Rosanie, who has a group of 4,000 women in southern Haiti. They started a fishing collective, and just in the hurricane two days ago, they lost all of their boats and 90 fishing nets. Now, I know a big NGO that lives nearby has 10 trucks that they haven't used for a year, each one costing the $30,000 or $40,000. I know with half the money they spent on one truck, this business could come back and employ 20 women and feed an entire village. Technology is certainly the biggest revelation. But please, all you men out there, don't think I'm excluding you you men who are smart and compassionate. I believe that the new feminine has no gender. The new feminism is an energy. It's a principle that men and women both possess. It's a trait that's defined by gentleness and compassion and heart. We're stronger together than we are alone, and we are moving into an age where these values can and must take the lead in all of our discussions. I'm very happy to say, after 45 years, I am standing in my own divine rights, finally. I have gone recently from being a teenager, I'm a little old for the transformation, but <laughs> into an adult woman. I am finally in possession of myself. And I know that many women in the world are joining me on this path every day. I'm grateful to be a part of this revolution, and I ask you to join me. Not Francais, which in Creole is we advance. Or I found this today, Italian, abbiamo anticipato. Or in Shona, Pamberi. Or in Swahili, Awali. So whatever language you speak, there's a way to name this revolution, we advance. Thank you very much. Thank you.